Hi and welcome to my OCR AA level biology revision session with me Christine. So today's lesson I want to look at regulatory mechanisms for gene expression. So let's just take a step back and remind ourselves about about what is going to happen when a gene is expressed. Now, we know that a gene can be either turned on where it is transcribed, or it can be turned off where it is inhibited in that transcription. But before we can understand that, let's just remind ourselves about what a gene is. So a gene is a section of a DNA that contains that complete sequence of bases, the codon, to code for an entire protein. Now, we know that we have euchromatin, which is our loosely wound DNA during interphase. Now, it's important that we note when it is loosely wound during interphase, this is the point where protein synthesis can occur. Now, this is because it is currently in interphase and therefore it is not tightly wound. And what is it that causes that tightly wound DNA structure, well that's known as a nucleosome. So a nucleosome is our histone proteins with our DNA wrapped around it. Now we know DNA is negatively charged and we know that our nucleosome is the DNA wrapped twice around this histone protein. So therefore if DNA is negatively charged, the protein, the histone protein is positively charged and that is what causes them to be attracted to each other. So a nucleosome is one histone protein with the DNA wrapped around it twice. And that is a way in which we can regulate transcription. Now, if we understand that, we then need to understand that actually we can do what's known as acetylation. We can add an acetyl group to the histone protein which would reduce its positive charge. That therefore will cause the DNA to coil less tightly. So if we are making it less positively charged, it is not going to attract the DNA quite in the same way. We're going to coil it a lot less. Well, if we think about prophase and we think about the fact that our chromosomes need to condense, they are going to be tightly wound together, that is what's known as heterochromatin. Well, that's the opposite. We're not reducing the positive charge. What we're going to do is we're actually going to methylate this time, add a methyl group to the histone proteins, making them more hydrophobic. And what that will do is that will cause the DNA to coil more tightly together. So why is this important? Why am I talking about this? Well, it's important that you understand that for transcription to happen, we need for our helicase to be able to unzip the DNA, to be able to break the hydrogen bonds so that free RNA nucleotides can come along and join by complementary base pairs. Well, if the DNA is wrapped tightly around histone proteins or it's completely supercoiled into condensed chromosomes, then helicase is not going to be able to access the DNA to therefore do the unzipping. So this is going to regulate the expression of a gene. What we also need to understand is that as cells differentiate, we actually do what's known as DNA methylation. We alter the expression of the gene by methylating the DNA. And what that means is where we have cytosine, we can methylate it, we can add a methyl group. By adding a methyl group to the cytosine, it is going to inhibit transcription. So as the cells differentiate, that's module two, when you're looking at cell differentiation, we are switching genes off, we are inhibiting the transcription. So by modifying the DNA or by modifying the histones, what we are doing is we are affecting the way in which transcription can occur. Now, what we talk about when we look at this 
transcriptional level is we talk about transcription factors. Now, there are two things that transcription factors can do. They can either promote transcription by helping RNA polymerase to bind to that DNA molecule, or they can inhibit transcription by blocking RNA polymerase from binding to the DNA. So when we look at transcription factors in eukaryotic organisms, it's much more complicated because we are bigger organisms with a lot more involved in the process. So when we looked at the transcriptional level in prokaryotes, the only one you need to know is the lacoperon. So if you haven't seen my video on that one, then do check that out. Whereas when it comes to eukaryotic organisms, because they have histone proteins associated with their DNA, that makes it a more complicated process. And therefore, they will expect you just to name it as being transcription factors and then apply that to whichever concept they have given you in your exam question. So just remind yourself, what is transcription? Well, transcription is where we have our gene being copied into mRNA by DNA helicase unzipping the strand, our free RNA nucleotides forming complementary base pairs, and the RNA polymerase binding to a promoter region moving down the gene and when it moves down the gene it builds those phosphodiester bonds on the single strand of what's known as our pre-mRNA. So that single strand that has been built by the RNA polymerase building the phosphodiester bonds that is known as your pre-mRNA. So after the transcriptional level We've then got what's known as our post-transcriptional level. So the regulation of the gene post-transcriptional level is where we're going to modify this mRNA strand. So we've got our RNA polymerase, which is going to result in transcription, our pre-mRNA. And then you need to know that there are sections on your pre-mRNA which are known as coding exons and non-coding, which are introns. Now, what needs to happen now is that although when transcription occurs within the coding section, that transcription, that pre-mRNA, pre has got regions which are non-coding that need to be removed. Now, that is done through a process called splicing. So the introns, these non-coding DNA sections, are actually spliced out of the pre-mRNA. Now that will leave us with mature mRNA, which is a small enough section that can leave through the nuclear pore. But what's really interesting is the way in which they can be spliced together. As I showed above, I have got five exons. So therefore, what should happen is those exons should be spliced and stuck together to give us one, two, three, four, five. Well, what's really interesting is the way that the splicing can occur can result in different sections being removed that give us different types of proteins being produced. So instead of one, two, three, four, five, I could have one, two, three has been spliced out along with the intron. So I now have one, two, four, five, or two could be spliced out along, or we could have two and four. So what that does is that results in this mRNA modification, which can lead to different types of proteins being produced. Now, the other thing to note in this post-transcriptional level, what we've also got is that we have a cap and a tail that's going to be added on, and that is to prevent degradation in the cytoplasm and also to aid its binding to the ribosome. So we've got our pre-mRNA, which is then spliced, the introns are spliced out, leaving us with our mature RNA, and our mature RNA is able to leave through the nuclear pores to the ribosomes for translation to occur. So let's just remind ourselves about translation then. We have our mRNA is going to move to the ribosome. 
Our tRNA molecule, the anticodon, forms complementary base pairs with the mRNA codon. The tRNA brings along that corresponding amino acid. The peptide bond is formed by a condensation reaction. And we end up with our primary structure of the polypeptide, which will then lead to the secondary and tertiary structure of the protein. Now that is translation. So when we look at gene regulation, the next thing we need to understand is that there is a regulation of gene expression known as the post-translational level. This is where proteins can be modified after translation has occurred. So what we have here is an inactive protein kinase. Now, you should know about protein kinase and you should know about first messengers and secondary messengers. So we have got cyclic AMP, which is a secondary messenger that is going to activate my protein kinase. So what we have is this activation of a protein kinase. We have modified it after translation and it is then going to modify other proteins by adding a phosphate group to other proteins to activate them. So the protein kinase is activated by cyclic AMP, a secondary messenger, and that protein kinase then activates other enzymes within the cells. So for example, if we were talking about adrenaline, adrenaline binds to the receptor that therefore activates the production of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then activates the protein kinase. The protein kinase will then activate enzymes so that the glycogen will be hydrolyzed down into the glucose molecules so that we can release the glucose and that can help with the fight or flight response. So it's important that we understand the way in which the enzymes are activated with this post-translational level. So I hope you've liked this video and if you have then please do click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already done so please do check out www.aiqchat.com.